Welcome you to Harvester this morning, and uh, we have a special treat for those of you who follow us on Facebook. Uh, you know this is this was, this was coming, but we are going to have our lead pastor at Harvester Overall, Doyle Roth, uh, come up here. And let me just tell you a little bit about Doyle. He has been uh, with Harvester for quite a while, and he was making fun of me because I said that he had been here a long, long time. But he really has been with Harvester. Uh, as God has blessed the church through the years, and uh, I think since the time they were our size, uh, and uh, just uh, has seen, you know, how God has worked through many different people, you know, including himself, and just Gene and him have been faithful through it all, and as you get to talk to Joel, you realize that uh, he, you know, the depth of his ministry, just who he is, his character for Christ, is one of the things that I love the most, uh, I just know uh, when we meet about every other week, you know, and just talk about the, the teaching, you know, I just know what his heart is for for us to learn more from God's word, the truth that he has for us. And so I'm going to ask him to come up here. Uh, he decided to stay last time down there because he's probably, what, a foot taller than me. You can go up here, man. And uh, so your legs have to be adjusted from what you're used to, just to come to the pace. Uh, but though we're so glad and excited to have you. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll, I'll let him take it from here. Father, thank you so much for just who you are. Thank you for Doyle and Jean and the testimony that they've shown through the years, Lord, and what it means to faithfully serve you. I pray that you continue to bless them. And uh, Lord, uh, bless Harvester as we, Lord, strive to, to lead people to, to find and follow you. And Lord, as Doyle preaches to us this morning about what it means to have peace with you, Lord, to have peace in this life, I pray that you just use them. Let your Holy Spirit convict us when we need to be convicted. And, and Lord, I to be just uh, have the reassurance that you are with us, Lord, for those of us who need that. I just use him. Uh, we thank you and praise this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. He's a good guy, isn't he? Yeah. I want to come down in here. We love Gustavo and Julie. They're little babies. They're not so little anymore, are they? All grown up, but we are thrilled to be a part of of a church working together and serving you, and it's just good to see Bill up front here. This is Doug and Joyce Wiley, who are serve as our some of our elders. And um, they talk about how long I've been there. Well, Doug and Joyce have been there even longer than me. So it, it's just good to be a part of a fellowship where we serve and honor together. So we commend you for the work that you're doing out here. We're going through our belief series. If I got a book. You get one if you know. What's nice is it's just a topic of Bible. So almost everything in here is scripture arranged in topics. So when we want to learn a subject, today we're going to be talking about peace. So we pulled several scriptures, not all of them, because there's many of them, but several of them that talk about peace. Put them all in one chapter so you can read them and learn and understand what God has to say. That's why we talk about what? Talk about what it means to believe. What is it that we should believe as, as followers of Jesus? So much of our world says that they're Christians and they have all kinds of opinions about God, but they don't match up with the Bible at all. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to know, need to know who He is. If we're going to follow Him, not some made-up version about Jesus, right? We need to follow Him. We need to know who He is. So I was all through the fall. What does the Bible say about God, the Bible, what we should be, what we should do? And then at the beginning of this year, we looked at how do we live this out? What should a follower, what should a believer do? And we Gustavo will share those with you. And now we're looking at the virtues. Who, what, just what is a follower? What is he? What is she like? If we're going to be this follower, these things should just be part of our life. As you notice, if we go through these, as we go through these over the next several weeks, they're fruit of this Holy Spirit in our life. So when you accept Jesus in your heart and your life, he becomes part of you. This is the natural result. It should be. There's people who have been Christians a whole lot of time. And they don't look like a loving, joyful, peaceful, kind, gracious, uh, patient person. And that should be in every one of our lives. They should be growing in our lives as a follower of Jesus. So we're taking a look at what are these, uh, just the byproduct of being a follower. How are these things produced in our life? So the key question we're going to look at today is, where do I find strength to battle anxiety and fear? Would you all like to know that? We have this anxiety, this fear in our life. It's just a part of it. It's going to be there. And we think, how do we overcome this? How do we do this? How do we walk through this? All right, so does anybody in this room have any anxiety? You do? Wow. Does anybody in this room have any fear? Yeah. Well, I, 
every day. It's going to be there. I thought when I was younger that that's something when you got older, old people don't have this stuff, as in anybody over 25, right? I mean, it's like as you get life figured out, things going to be okay. But sometimes you get older and you realize life is really fragile and this could really hurt. And you get cautious after being hurt so many times. And not just talking physically, but I'm talking emotionally and mentally. And where you used to jump into that relationship, now you're jumping a little more cautiously and unsure. Even when sometimes things are going really good, you just kind of go, I don't know, because it's going to happen sometime. And that anxiety and that fear can overwhelm us. We all have problems. We want to have those superpowers to overcome them. When I was little, I wanted to be Superman. Anybody have a superhero in your kid? Anybody have one? Yeah. What's yours? What? Aquaman. Ooh, that's pretty cool. How about yours? Wonder Woman. I, I never wanted to be that. Just for me. <laughs> Wonder Woman. How about somebody over here? Gustavo. What was yours? Iron Man. Iron Man. <laughs> tough. Well, Iron Man's cool, but he has to put on a whole seat. Whole suit to be tough. See, Superman's just cool by himself. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 there was no Iron Man when I was back in the prehistoric days. Sorry. So, but the whole idea how can we overcome? I remember being on the school bus and thinking, how cool would it be if I could just fly off this bus and all those mean kids, I could just fly right over the top of them. And we want to overcome, we want to do those things. One of those superpowers in the sense of this world, those are fun stories. But we do have an incredible power source in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he does give us something to overcome the powers of evil in this world and how to get through it. And he promises this gift of peace. And sometimes it's so hard to believe that it's there in the midst of all the anxiety and the fear that's around us. And peace is the absence of fear and worry. So you can live in this world and still have this peace that comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit, and that is the ultimate superpower. It is the God of the universe coming and dwelling in each one of our lives, and He says, I can give this to you. When we live in that anxiety that leads to fear, that leads to apprehension, I mean, it can just really hurt us physically, doesn't it? You know, people that just carry that weight of fear so much, it, it just knocks them down physically, and then it attacks them emotionally. Attacks of mentally, you become this very fearful person. You become very cautious. You can be very bitter. You can live in, de in despair and live in depression. And have I completely depressed you so far? <laughs> it's like, yeah, can we just not talk about that stuff? But it's there. We know it's there. But the Bible says we live in this world, but we don't have to be overcome by this world. Instead, Jesus came. He says he overcomes this world and the fear of all that's in it. We all struggle at times. We share those needs together. We have a prayer wall on our website that I hope you can use. And the one thing with your connect cards, you pass them. It's information about being new. Well, back it says how to pray for one another. You put those in there when you do. People do pray for you. And there's power when we pray together. So I encourage you to put those on there, but you go on and you pray for other people that know, hey, God, would you intervene in this person's life? Because God says he does when we go in and ask. In the New Testament, the word for peace is the word Irene. Has anybody ever named Irene? No, that's a great name because it means, it means peace. Actually, the definition is a state of peace and tranquility, harmony. We'd like to be there. Now, the Old Testament word for peace is something that you guys, probably everybody in this room knows. You know what it is? Shalom. Very good. Shalom. How, how great is a greeting? Say hello, hello, hello. But it's nice to, when you greet someone, to say peace. No. The idea of giving God's peace upon you is the intent of that. Jesus used the word shalom often. It was saying whenever he meets someone, greets someone, is offering them peace. And I believe when he said it, it was said with sincere meaning. One of the times he used it was after his crucifixion. When all the disciples were scared and all huddled in a room, and they were they were in this room with the doors locked and so scared, they didn't know if which one of them were going to be arrested next and killed, and they were just so scared that Jesus had died, and they didn't know what was going on. Well, Jesus rose from the dead. While they were in this room completely full of fear and anxiety, the Bible says that Jesus just appeared in the room in his heavenly body. So he just magically shows up, and the first thing he says is, Shalom. What do you think they felt? Probably scared to death, right? Some of them had to go change their robes after they appeared in the room. 
I'm just like, oh. So he walks in the room and says, Shalom. They're just absolutely scared. But he comes in the midst of all of their fear and anxiety to bring them peace, which he does. Because of his conquering death and risen from the dead for us. And then we have this promise from the day of Pentecost, which we're going to honor that coming up here just shortly, that when the Holy Spirit came upon them and gives them all the blessings of being a follower of Christ for the dwelling presence of in our lives. And one of those things he gives us, the Bible says, is peace. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. There's a lot of great 316 verses in the Bible. This is one of those up. It says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. One of the titles of Jesus is Prince of Peace. So we say, the Lord of Peace, Jesus, Messiah, he's going to give himself, give you peace, his peace at all times. It's continually. The verb is that he continually gives it to you. He's continually giving this peace from heaven that he paid for so you could have it in every way. Means in every circumstance, no matter what's going on, you can have this peace from God. No matter what anxiety that you have, the fear that's been put up in the world, God says, I want to give you this peace that he paid for on the cross, that he, he overcome, came all the sin and the heartaches there. He's overcome, so he's given you this, he's given you his presence, and he says, I will give you this peace. At all times, in every way, the Lord be with all of you. Reminder that God's presence is always with us. So in your bullets, I just have a just a few things on here to kind of help us walk through this and see where we're going. As far as we can have peace with God. We can have this peace that we live in, just that peace with God. Recognizing if I want peace in my world from all my fear, my anxiety, and overwhelming, it's got to start between me and God. It's got to start between you and God. You've got to have a relationship with Him because He's the giver of that peace. And of course, that means we need to accept Him. You accept Jesus in your heart and your life. And not some version, some little superficial thing out here. Go back to last fall. What does it mean to believe in God? Who is the God of the Bible? What is Jesus all about? Okay, don't use these phrases, well, my Jesus is like this. Like, if you just designed in the package and put it in this little box. That's not what it is. We know who he is and what the Bible says and truly accept Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. It says when we do that, then we'll have peace. So in our chapter, one of the scriptures listed is Romans chapter 5. It says this, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So when you accept Jesus in your heart, you've been justified by the faith, means you've been forgiven of your sins. Bill said earlier when we come to communion time to remind ourselves that God has forgiven all your sins. When he does, you accept Jesus in your heart, your life, you have this access to him, and it comes because of the grace of Jesus Christ. So we need to accept him, who he is, God into your life. He's forgiven your sins, and we walk with him, and you have a relationship with him, this Lord of peace. He's been the Lord of our life. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says this, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have, what? Peace. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. The idea... He recognizes it. It's not saying, okay, you pretend that the world doesn't exist. You pretend you don't have problems. And if you really believe, you won't have any problems. He didn't say that at all, did he? He says, you will have trouble. <clears throat> Trouble's going to be in this world. He created it good but because of the sin of you and me and the rest of mankind. This broken world that we're in, we have trouble. You make horrible decisions up other people. Other people make up horrible decisions and mess up your little world. It's this broken world we live in. So he says you will have trouble, but in the midst of that you have peace. It says you may have peace from God. God has overcome the world. Did Jesus live this perfect life when he was on earth? He had a lot of trouble, didn't he? Jesus had a lot of trouble, but he lived in a state of peace with God and he has overcome Satan 
And he says he offers that to each one of us. A couple chapters before, John chapter 14 begins with, don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust in me. And then down in verse 27 it says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, but do, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He says, what I give to you is different from the world. It's not one of these things that comes and goes and is going to be there, but he says, what I establish with you is there. It's solid and it's sure. We can have peace with God, knowing that he's there with us. The feeling that you don't, that you know it's all wrong and what's going to happen? I have a fear. He says, I want you to live alone. The fear of, I got this really bad news or sad news. He says, I want you to live above that. And know there's a peace beyond all that. In the midst of not knowing how it's going to end, I know what's going to happen and the fear of what's going to be ahead. He says, I want you to live above that. Because God has overcome the world. The 23rd Psalm is one that many of you know well. And it goes through all those different things in life. The last verse says this. Surely goodness and love will follow me. The King James says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The reminder, surely, that means positive. It is going to happen. We can count on it. It is for sure. God is there. His word is true. When he says he's going to follow you, be with you, it is true. Amen? Amen. You can count on it. God's presence is with you. It says His goodness and His love is going to follow you. The, the Hebrew word there, follow you, is chase after. It's going to be like on you. It's going to be right on top of you. A monkey on your back. It ain't going to let you go. And sometimes we think, oh God, where are you? What's going on? He says, I'm right here. I'm right with you. And sometimes we can veer off this path and get way over here. Where, but it doesn't look like where God would be at all. We need to get back into the presence of God because He says, I'm chasing after you. I'm with you. The verse says, surely, I know it. God is there. His word is true. His love, his mercy, his compassion is on you. His love for you. It says, all the days of my life, every day, today, he's with you. Tomorrow, he's going to be with you. When you go to work, he's going to be with you. When you go to school, you're fearful. He's going to be with you. Even when you're those family gatherings, they think you're crazy. He says, I'm going to be with you. He's there. So his presence is always with you. And not only is he with me every day of my life here, but I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It means I have this hope, this promise that is sure, that's solid. When we're dealing with anxiety, with fear, we need to quote verses. The well, 23rd Psalm is great. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's hard, it's hard times of life. But to the very last verse, if you can just do one, memorize that life. Amen? So establishing I this relationship with God. Get this in mind. God is with me. God loves me. God is there for you. And God wants to be in your life every day if we accept him and allow him into our life. So we need to accept him. Second one is we have peace when we live in obedience of God. When we have that relationship with him, then I've got to decide I'm going to walk with him every day. The word for that we call righteousness. Living a lifestyle that God can bless and walk with us. Chuck Brewer said, when I trust Jesus, I have faith. But when I practice righteousness, I am faithful. So it's not just enough to believe, but you need to walk with him and obey him so we have a relationship with him. In your book, we see Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the very end of your chapter. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's a wonderful list, isn't it? Don't we desire that stuff? We want to have all those good things in our life, but instead of thinking about these things, sometimes we think about all the crowd of the world. We watch the news every night, and are you thoroughly depressed and mad and angry when you finish that? It's just all the stuff is going wrong. Sometimes the people fester on all the bad stuff. We, we get on and we gossip. We share negative. Did you hear she said this? Or he said this. And he did this. We do it at work where this happened and this happened. And it's negative. And there's problems. And people are mad. Politics. Everything's bad. Everything's going to be horrible. Everybody's going to tear up the world. 
because we fester on the negative. And we get all that stuff and we get, as a follower of Jesus, we're festering on that, thinking of all that stuff much more than we are thinking of what Jesus said. He said, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. That's where our mind needs to go. Now, we're in this world of trouble. We don't just escape away from it completely. We're in the world. But we think about these things of God. Going on next verse. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of what? Peace will be with you. So we need to get our mind up where God wants us to be. We need to understand the things of God and believe and trust that His presence is here and His grace is real. I'm going to walk with Him. I'm going to think those things. And then I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to do this. I'm going to live it out. And when we do that, we're in a place where now God's peace can dwell in our hearts. It's going to be with us every day. So something that we believe, we trust, and we accept Him, is something that we walk out. The Lord's Prayer comes along in the verse. It says, Your kingdom come. What does the rest of it say? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want God's will to be done. How's that going to be done? In us. We want God to work in this world. We want God to move in this world. He does it through people. So we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. Saying, God, I want your will, your kingdom in my life. Amen. I want to serve you. I want to do what you call me to do. God, I want your presence in my life. I want to walk in it. And when it's done, when I live in it, then his will is going to be done in your life. You obey him. You serve him. Sometimes we look at the Bible as this whole list of rules and do's and don'ts. And God just waits there to zap you when you mess it up. That's one way to look at it. I don't think it's the correct way at all. God created and designed this beautiful world. We allowed men and women to make a choice and we choose sin. And even after we're saved, we come to him and we go, Oh, I kind of really want this, but I really want this. And we mess up. But you get this wonderful gift of grace. And he says, Let me help you. Let me give you this little manual. In fact, if you follow this, this is how I designed the world. This is how I designed you. And if you will live this way, then you'll walk in a way that everything's going to work and you're going to receive the blessings of life that's going to be there. And you'll receive the peace that's there for you. But if you choose not to follow this and go in your own way over here, it ain't going to work out so well. And you're not going to have peace. You're going to have this heartache that's in the world because you're living as the world. He says, come back over here and do what I've asked you to do. Does that make sense? We need to follow this. We need to obey Him and walk with Him. Romans chapter 14 is a verse, if I can find it, that says this. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. I mean, it's just not a big in this world. But it's of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what your kingdom come and will be done in my life. How do we do that? Then get above all the stuff of this world and start living in righteousness. Obey God. Start living in the peace that he has for us and this joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, which we stop when we talk about the joy next week. How do we walk in God? We're going to serve him. We're going to honor him. When we do that, it's going to be there. How do we walk in righteousness? Because you guys, you start being the father that God called you to be. Why don't you be the mom that God called you to be? You be the husband. Be the wife that God's called you to be. Be the person at work of integrity. Give it at your best, even when the others around you are. You live an honest life. You live a lifestyle that God can bless you. You live a truthful life. You don't bend the corners to get ahead. You don't cheat. You don't lie. You live a lifestyle that God can truly bless. Then you live in that righteousness. You live in that, that peace. Because we're walking with God. And the joy is going to be a part of it. Sound good? It's there. It's for each one of us. So we have the peace when we live in peace with God. And in obedience of God. We also have it when we live in the grace of God. The grace of God, really we did communion, we stop and remember, Jesus paid for this horrible death, took our guilt upon him so we can have forgiveness, every one of us. Grace is something that we do not deserve. We live in it, we, we have it, but we take that grace of God and we give it to others. We live with others in that as well. So we need to be a peacemaker. We're going to be the peacemaker in other people's lives. They're going to understand the peace of God by how you live it out with them. They're going to see a walk as you walk with them. They're going to be a part of their life. In your book in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it has this passage. 
It says, do not pay. Well, verse 17 is not to pay evil for evil. Be careful that you always write nice to one. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it's possible. It can't always happen. Some people will never want to do that. But as far as your side of it, you live at peace with those around you. The next verse says, do not take revenge. That's the opposite of living at peace. Like the Old Testament says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's God's. He's the judge, not you. So however it's possible, you live at peace. That means you're always the giver of peace. You're always the giver of grace. You're extending that. Remember, Jesus gives it to us when we do not deserve it. And so we give that same grace to others. There's people in your life that have hurt you, that have done so wrong, they're evil-minded, they're doing it wrong, but God says you be the peacemaker. You give grace to them the same way Jesus did to people that did not deserve it. You reach out, you extend it. Verse 21 going on, it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when the evil is around there, don't return it. That's our natural spite, our way of doing it. People get at you, you get back. They mouth off, you mouth right back. Sometimes we can be very ungodly in how we react. Somebody does say something and your mind just starts working right there. Mine does. It's like, oh, I can do this. I can get back here. We can get over here. We can do this. I want to make sure the, the boss sees how much they messed out so we set them up. Is that being a peacemaker? Certainly not being gracious by any means. And we need to repent of those times when we want to return that evil and realize we're the giver of grace. We're the ones who are supposed to respond to others. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, in the Lord's Prayer, it says different things on there, but it comes to a point where we're asking God to forgive. It talks about forgiveness. We give in a gracious way that's kind towards others. That's going, we want to love on people the way God has loved on us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, it says this, that blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God. So the peacemaker, when you're going to give peace, then you're establishing God's relationship. You're going to see that. You're, you're going to be giving God's grace is going to be on there. You'd be the peacemaker at home. You'd be the peacemaker at your work. You'd be the peacemaker at your school. If you don't join in the retaliation, but you're going to be the person who gives out. You're not going to be the person that has grudges to hold against other people. When we were early in our ministry at Harvester, back in those umpteen years before you ever existed, Gustavo, Back then, we had, we had a children's choir. We got together. We, we did these songs. And one of the little musicals we did was talking about kids loving Jesus and following Jesus. And then in walks this Mr. Grump. And he was a mean old guy. He was angry. And he yelled at the kids. He chased them off. And he was the house on the corner that every kid stayed away from because he was so grouchy. You ever know Mr. Grump? But that's none of you in this room, right? But you know this Mr. Grump? Remember, as a, as a small child, there was this one lady at church who looked like a grandma. She was mean. She was sour. She never smiled. And I stayed away from her because she would yell at you if you did something wrong at church. And I was so confused as a small child because she looks like a grandma, but she doesn't act like a grandma because she's mean. Now, how did Mr. Grump become Mr. Grump? And how did this lady become that? Because of heartache. Because someone did something evil to them. Maybe it's from their own childhood. Maybe through life. Maybe someone abandoned and, and betrayed and did the worst things to them. And when that happens to them, they chose a different route. They were chose to remain in that bitterness and that heartache and that hurt and that pain. And the result, they didn't live in the peace of God. And here they end up with this older person, mean, bitter, and resentful. And God says, he's overcome the world. He says, you need to be the peacemaker. Even when the world dishes out evil, you have the choice and the decision. Are you going to return that evil? Are you going to live in the spite that the evil one gave to you? Or are you going to return it with God's grace? First of all, accepting him back in with him. God, forgive my heart for the bitterness that I feel and the anger. And you give grace. It's hard sometimes to do the grade school thing, forgive or forget, shake hands, everything's okay. Because you go, no, it's not okay. They're really not. They're mean. They're still mean to me. But you give grace, undeserved, 
You give grace. You don't put yourself in a situation maybe you're going to be taken advantage of over and over and over again in an abusive relationship. But you're going to be a person who gives God's grace. It's not deserved, but you want to live in it. When you live in that, you're going to be able to live in the peace of God. Make sense? So I'm going to accept God. I'm going to walk with Him. I'm going to serve Him. I'm going to do the things He's called us to do. And I'm going to be a giver of grace. I'm going to be a peacemaker. And last, we have peace when we live in prayer with God. And this relationship is ongoing. I'm going to pray with him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to share my struggles, my joys. I'm going to walk in the way. And I'm going to pray with God instead of worry. That's the opposite. When I worry, it's like it's all on me. I've got to fix this. I've got to do it all. And I remember to turn around and I give it to God. The key verse for this chapter is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. First part, do not be anxious about anything. How are you doing there? I failed. Did you? Anybody get anxious? Sure we do. So this is the standard. So we need to be the point where we realize, I'm not going to be anxious about anything. I'm going to trust God in all circumstances. The world's going to mess up. The world's going to do evil. Bad things are going to happen. I'm going to have trouble. But Jesus says, I'm overcome. And I'm living in you. And I'm walking with you. So no matter what the circumstances, doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect and wonderful. There's going to be some hard days ahead. But God's presence is with us. So instead of being fearful about it, I'm going to trust God in every situation, everything around you, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what can happen today or tomorrow, every situation, I'm going to go to God in prayer, petition, because I'm going to thank Him, I'm going to praise Him, and I'm going to say, God, please, I need your help. Present those requests to God. Going on verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, no matter what the circumstances, is going to be with you. Again, this is the book of Philippians. Do you know where Paul was when he wrote this book? He was in jail. He was in prison. Not because he did anything wrong, but just because he's a follower of Jesus. Here's this follower of Jesus Living in righteousness, living grace, he's arrested because the message went against the day of the age. And he's in prison not knowing if he's going to ever get out or not, or be killed for his faith. And he's saying, don't be anxious about anything. You present your request to God. And as a result, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. It means he had every right to be angry and bitter and mad at God and mad at the world, but he didn't. You have every reason probably to be mad at this other person resentful in your life, but guard your heart. Don't become that bitter person. Don't become the person who lives in anxiety all your life because God's peace will guard your heart and guard your mind. Learn to think as the way God wants you to think about the most lovely and true, those things of God above the things of this world. And then we have the peace of God. Kendall says that the Bible is the most underlying book in the world. And it also says that this verse is the most underlying verse in the Bible. Now, I think it'd be John 3, 16 or 23 Psalm. Well, we don't know, but this is the one that people go to because we need the peace of God. This is what we desire. And when we receive it, when we have this relationship with God, and you pray, you pray constantly. Pray every day, God, help me. And God, help me rise up to this place where you've called me to be and walk with Him. We live in the prayer and walking. Max Lucado tells a story about Chippy the parakeet. Kind of a dumb story. But Chippy lives his little life in his bird cage and singing away. And whenever I heard this, I think of Tweety. You know, probably don't know who Tweety is, do you? Do you know Tweety is? Okay, right. I think a little Tweety up here, right? So Tweety's up here, or Chippy's up here. And, and the owner decides she needs to clean his cage. So she gets the shop back out because there's some nasty stuff at the bottom of Chippy's little cage. And she's cleaning up the top of it. Chippy's up here singing. So she just cleaned up, and her cell phone rings. So she reaches over and looks at her cell phone and thought, oh, I'll call him back later. And she turns around and Chippy's gone. And she thinks, where did he fly around? Do we didn't fly around. And she can't find Chippy. And she's, oh, no, the worst happens. So she opens up the shop back and there's a little Chippy, kind of a little dirty and dusty and a total mess that looks like he'd just been through a whirlwind, which he kind of had been. So she pulls Chippy out and he's just filthy. He looks awful. And he's scared. And so she thinks, oh, I need to clean him up. So she takes him to the kitchen faucet 
turns it on, holds him underneath there to wash him off. And now Chippy is a drowned little rat. He's not happy at all. He's shivering and she's, oh no, he's cold. So she gets her hair dryer out. Gonna dry it out for him. Chippy's having a really bad day. He tells the story, he says, Chippy's back in his little clean bird cage and he doesn't sing for a couple of weeks. So he's just been whirlwind. His life has been turned upside down. He's been soaked and drenched by all the problems that are there, and now he's been blown around like crazy. And some of you feel that way today, don't you? You've been there, you understand, Chippy? You think he's just sitting there singing. Why did all this world do to him? We're trouble. So we have this heartache in our life. It's a dumb story, but I can relate to that. You can too. God says, in the midst of all of this craziness going on around you, Chippy didn't do anything wrong. You're thinking, why did I happen to be? Well, because we're in the world, and Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. He said, this is trouble. You have peace because I'm there with you. You can walk with me. You can have this grace that you can give, keep giving peace to other people. And you can keep your song going because God is overcoming. <laughs> God, I'm thankful for each person in this room. I'm thankful for their presence here because it states a desire to know you, to walk with you. Father, I pray that you would meet us wherever we're at, in our highest joys, in our greatest fears. Father, that your presence would become even more real to each one of us. I pray that you give courage to the person today that needs to take that step of faith and accept you in their life. I pray that you give courage to a person here who needs to make a decision for integrity. A decision to walk with you and learn how to be the man or the woman that we need to be. Father, I pray that you give us a, a new sense of your grace, that we can give grace to those that don't deserve it, because you give it that to us. Father, I pray that you meet our needs. Father, that we this week, no matter what happens, we would have your peace that comes from your presence in our life. Would you bless us now, God, as we respond to you? Jesus, I pray. Hey, if you're still watching, we just want to thank you for uh, coming by and just watching this message. And I just want to share real fast uh, the reason why Harvester uh, does this is because uh, we believe that uh, you know people need to hear about the Lord Jesus. It is our mission to lead people to find and follow Him. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have not received Jesus uh, in your life uh, ever, I just want you to listen to these words in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but, to, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So if you uh, have never received Jesus into your life, I, I encourage you, investigate. Take some time. This is the most important decision that you could ever make. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you right here at the bottom of the screen just our website. You can always go to harvesterchristian.org and find out a little more about our church. And if you don't live locally, then I just invite you find uh, a church that you call home that believes in the Bible as the Word of God and just start worshiping, start learning more about who our Lord is. Um, I hope you have a great day and uh, thanks for watching.